Welcome back to Cityscape. In this episode of Secret People, we will cover Yuri Bezmyanov, a Soviet journalist and former KGB informant. The last 60 years has been an era dominated by social justice, whether it's in a form of equal rights for women, LGBTQ, or the Black Lives Matter movement. As a former libertarian, I tend to be fiscally conservative but socially liberal, so to someone like me, these equal right movements appear sensible, a march towards progress. Our guest in this episode argues otherwise. In fact, Yuri states that such equal right movements are a direct result of communist infiltration. There are covert sabotages meant to destabilize and fracture the country. As always, let's start with a brief background. Yuri Bezmyanov was born in Mitiski, Russia on December 11, 1939. His father was a high-ranking Red Army officer, later put in charge of inspecting Soviet troops in foreign countries. When he was 17, he entered Moscow State University, where he studied languages and became an expert in Indian culture. He also went through military training, where he trained on strategic war games and prisoner interrogation. After graduating college, Bezmyanov was recruited by the KGB a Russian intelligence and security agency. On a side note, Vladimir Putin, current president of Russia, was also a KGB agent. Anyway, Bezmyanov spent two years in India working as a translator and public relations officer for the construction of refineries. He was then called to work for the Russian Agency of International Information, where his job was, ironically, to spread disinformation to foreign countries. He was then assigned in India as a press officer and public relations agent for the KGB. His main duties during this period was to convince intellectuals from around the world that the communist system was superior. Staged tours were given to writers and journalists, painting the communist system as efficient, productive, and egalitarian. It is during this period that Yuri increasingly saw the Soviet communist system as insidious and ruthless, which then led to his defection. My main uh, motivations to defect was, had nothing to do with affluence. It was mainly moral indignation, moral protest, rebellion against the inhuman methods of, of the Soviet system. Well, specifically, what did you object to? I objected, first of all, against oppression of my own dissidents and intellectuals. And that was the most disgusting thing that, that I witnessed as a, as a young man, young student, who was brought up uh, at a very troublesome period in our history, from Stalin to Khrushchev, from total tyranny and oppression to some kind of liberalization. Second, when I started working for the Soviet embassy in India, I, to my horror, I discovered that we are millions times more oppressive than any colonial or imperialist power in the history of mankind, that my country brings to India not freedom, progress, and, and friendship between the nations, but uh, racism, exploitation, and slavery, and, and, and of course economical inefficiency to this country. Since I fell in love with India, uh, I developed something which by KGB standards is extremely dangerous thing. It's called split loyalty when an agent likes a country of assignment more than his own country. I literally fell in love with this beautiful country, a country of great contrasts, but also great humility, great tolerance, and, and if philosophical and intellectual freedoms. My ancestors used to live in caves and eat raw meat when India was a highly civilized nation 6,000 years ago. So obviously the choice was not to the advantage of my own nation. I decided to defect and to entirely dissociate myself from that brutal regime. Ten years after escaping to Canada, Yuri moved to Los Angeles and wrote the book Love Letter to America under a pen name to conceal his identity. This book warns of a communist agenda to destabilize the West. It is also around this time that Yuri began publicly discussing the Soviet subversion model, which is the focus of this episode. By the way, those of you who are unsure as to why capitalism is a far more superior system than communism should watch my video on a subject. Now, let's look at these subversion techniques Bezmyanov speak of. 
There's not much hope for, for changes in, in my country, and the system will not collapse by itself simply because it's, it's being nourished by so-called American imperialism. This is the greatest paradox in history of mankind when uh, capitalist world supports and actively nourishes its own destru destroyer, destructor. Hmm. I think you're trying to tell us something. Oh in yes. This country. Mm -hmm. I'm trying <laughs> to tell you that it, it has to be stopped unless you want to end up in, in gulag system and enjoy all the advantages of socialist uh, equality. Uh, working for free, catching fleas on your body, sleeping on, on the planks of, of plywood in, in Alaska this time, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's where Americans will belong, unless they will wake up, of course, and force their government to stop aiding Soviet fascism. Subversion is the process of undermining the loyalties of social groups within the targeted country. This undermining then shifts the people's loyalty to the institutions of the aggressor. A subverter is not a James Bond flamboyant type you might expect from spies. Instead, he or she appears as a harmless intellectual, a writer, journalist, or university professor, whose aim it is to infuse ideas that subtly corrodes the cultural foundation of the country. Some subverters are aware of the purpose behind their work. Most of them, however, are idealists who are totally oblivious to the true agenda. Subversion consists of four steps. Demoralization, destabilization, crisis, and normalization. The first step is a period of demoralization. This is a time required to educate a single generation. It usually takes 15 to 20 years. It is in this stage that public opinion is shaped. Again, a subverter often comes in a form of an intellectual, a writer, a journalist, a university professor, who speaks of the horrors of capitalism and of the virtue of government. After years of being thought this narrative, the population becomes well-adjusted to this viewpoint. According to Bezmianov, America has already completed the stage. The hippies from the 60s have come into positions of power and that generation has been deeply contaminated by socialist values. Well, you spoke several times before about ideological subversion. That is a phrase that uh, I'm afraid some Americans don't fully understand. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion is, is the process which is legitimate, overt, and open. You, you can see it with your own eyes. All, all you have to do, all American mass media has to do, is to unplug their bananas from their ears, open up their eyes, and they can see it. There is no mystery. There is nothing to do with espionage. I know that espionage intelligence gathering looks more romantic. It sells more deodorants through the advertising, probably. That's why your Hollywood producers are so crazy about James Bond type uh, of, of thrillers. But in reality, the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of it intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, activne meropriatia in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy exposed to the ideology of the enemy.
In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result, the result you can see, most of the people who graduated in the 60s, dropouts or half-baked intellectuals, are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. The next step is destabilization. This is the stage we're probably in now. This stage targets the established institutions of a society and destabilizes them. Every institution is questioned at this stage under the disguise of social justice. Private affairs such as sexual orientation or physical disabilities also become politicized. The primary three institutions to be targeted during destabilization are economic, law and order, and media. The economy is destabilized by painting businessmen as villains and pitting labor against capital. Law and order is destabilized by creating polarized groups rather than local communities. Examples of this are seen in Republican versus Liberals or Vaxxers versus Anti-Vaxxers, Black Lives Matter versus Blue Lives Matters. In sum, society is driven by antagonistic groups and is completely destabilized because of it. Lastly, the media plays the role of further polarizing the groups by spreading disinformation. All of a sudden we see a homosexual. Fifteen years ago he did his dirty job and nobody cared. Now he makes it a political issue. It's a, a political issue. He demands recognition, respect, human rights, and he rallies a ra large group of people. And there are violent clashes between him and police, his group and, and ordinary people, no matter what. It's black against white, yellows against green, doesn't matter where the division line goes. As long as this group come into antagonistic clash, sometimes militantly, sometimes with firearms. That is destabilization. Crisis, the third stage, happens when a society can no longer function productively. It collapses. This can take shape in a form of civil war, financial meltdown, or invasion. At this stage, people will look for a savior. The pain of daily living will be so acute that people will beg for a strong leader or a strong government. It is at this point that the perpetrators who have been causing the subversion the whole time emerge as a savior. The last step is normalization. As it implies, it is at this stage that the new ruler stabilizes the country. All the social justice warriors are imprisoned or killed, for their job of destabilizing the country is complete and our service is no longer required. Normalization is basically where the new world order is established. An egalitarian socialist pyramid is created where some people are more equal than others. At that stage, the self-appointed rulers of the society don't need any revolution anymore. They don't need any radicalism anymore. So this is the reverse from destabilization. Basically, it is stabilizing the country by force. So all the sleepers and activists and social workers and liberals and homosexuals and professors and Marxists and Leninists are being eliminated physically sometimes. They've done their job already. Okay? They are not needed anymore. The new rulers need stability to exploit the nation, to exploit the country, to take advantages of the victory. Okay? So no more revolutionaries, please. And that's exactly what happens in a number of countries. It is important to note that Besmianov warned about this during the 80s. Forty years later, the political turmoil we witness today shows his predictions to be frighteningly accurate. He warns that America is being fully assaulted and that we should take action now before we reach the point of no return. Subversion can still be reversed during the demoralization and destabilization stage, but once we reach the stage of crisis, we've entered the point of no return. 
the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure, and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis, to promise people all kind of goodies and the paradise on earth. Uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition, and to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., with uh, benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale, who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfillable or not. He will go to Moscow to kiss the bottoms of, of new generation of Soviet assassins, never mind. He will create false illusions that the uh, situation is under control. Situation is not under control. Situation is disgustingly out of control. Most of the American politicians, media, and educational system trains another generation of people who think they are living at a peacetime. False. United States is in the state of war, undeclared total war against the basic principles and the foundations of, of this system. Since this is a location channel, one place you can check out is the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. The goal of this place is to lift the veil on the hidden world of intelligence. It not only displays that world's history, but shares its successes, failures, and controversies. This place is wicked cool and ultra-modern. Kids also absolutely love it. That place is a must-see if you ever visit Washington, D.C. Those of you who want to visit the International Spy Museum should save this location on a Cityscape app. It is difficult for me to swallow the messages of Yuri Bezmyanov. There are two reasons for this. First, conservatives are known for calling social movements they deem undesirable as communists. Interracial marriage, for an example, was viewed as communist during the 50s. Likewise, I also struggle with Bezmyanov because he does not cover how to discern genuine civil right movements from subversive ones. He seems to lump them all under a single umbrella. Prison reform, for example, a cause I care deeply about, is not a communist agenda. Whether you like to hear it or not, there are people being exploited by the prison system, and they are mostly minorities. Therefore, I leave this question to my audience. How do you know whether a social justice movement is genuine or a subversion method for collectivism? Leave your answer in a comment section. Anyway, I do suspect that much of what Bezmyanov says is indeed true. Many social justice narratives are divisive, economically irrational, and may indeed be a covert agenda for communism, i.e. total state power. As someone from Haiti, who's been lucky enough to come here, I appreciate America in ways only other foreigners can understand. Being a communist defector, Bezmyanov certainly shares that appreciation. People like him and I are simply acting out of self-interest when we care for this country. As Bezmyanov said, we are in this together. If America sinks, so will I. So for goodness sake, let's not let the ship go down. See you next time.